Public dialogue and civic engagement are important. They play a role in improving the health and well-being of Texans across our great state. That's why Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is proud to support Texas Tribune events like the conversation you're about to see. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable J.M. Lozano and the Honorable Eddie Lucio Jr. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being here tonight. I got up this morning, as I tend to do living in Texas these days, and looked at the price of oil. Price of oil was down in the low 30s, probably by, you know, don't know how it goes over the course of the day, but basically it's in the vicinity of $30 a barrel. A year ago at this time, the price of oil was just below $60 a barrel. Two years ago at this time, the price of oil was just below $110 a barrel. This is a topic of interest to people all over the state, but particularly to this part of the state. You all passed a state budget at the legislature that in part had revenue assuming that the price of oil would be higher than it is today. Do we have cause, Representative Lozano, to be concerned about the health of the Texas economy? Given the price of oil? You know, in, in general, I would say, by looking at the numbers, yes. Because uh, when you get that low, you obviously go into the next session knowing that the controller is going to estimate revenue. Um, and the concern I always have is, are they going to try and cut uh, funds that are essential to our state's future, like education or, or health care? And so the good thing is, though, is that the state's economy is very diversified. Uh, unlike other countries that uh, produce the same amount of oil, uh, the state of Texas has a, a very low portion of its revenue coming from oil and gas. In fact, it's 14% today, Representative, and the last time we had a problem with the price of oil and it affected the economy, it was actually 22%. Yeah. So we're more diversified today than we were. Yes. Yeah. And, and so uh, one of the unique things that, that happened last session is, and I think it, now in hindsight, it was probably the good decision was uh, the controller in the previous session had underestimated revenue, and so we had more expected re unexpected revenue, um, but the state didn't spend all of that amount. And so we'll, we'll be in good shape in terms of next session. Right. It'll make our fight stronger to make sure they don't cut essentially. So, and, and the conservative budget, by everyone's estimation, whether you like the budget or not, people would agree it's a conservative budget. That turns out to have been a good decision, given the news we've gotten since. Senator Lucio, Chairman, uh, uh, the state's unemployment rate has been below the national unemployment rate for 108 consecutive months. But there are concerns that the layoffs in the oil and gas sector may ultimately push our unemployment rate up. Those lines could cross this year. You've had the perspective, having served in office, whether it's 42 or 45 years, you were around the last time we had a conversation like this. You remember what it was like. Should we have anxiety about the health of the economy and the jobs picture, particularly because of the price of oil? I think uh, I think the state is doing very well economically. Let me let me add to the conversation. Uh, this this biennium's budget is not impacted by the uh, the lowering of oil prices. Um, the, the controller came to us with an estimate of 2.4 billion dollars uh, for the rainy day fund last session. Um, 1.7 was his estimate. The the next go around. Um, so we're not impacted this by any of Obviously, we, we need to be concerned. I think the, uh, the price will go up. The good news is that working families are able to go to the pump and fill up uh, uh, a lot. That's right, a you know, a dollar fifty you know, gasoline you know, is, I, I, is good I'm, news, right? I'm filling up my suburban. That's right. Thirty-nine dollars instead of seventy-two dollars. Right. So uh, silver lining. I'm able to see more constituents that way. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So silver lining, but you, but you understand. I'm just, I'm yeah. just kidding. Through that in for laughs, but seriously, yeah. I, I think I think we're doing well. Um, we'll continue to do well. I was concerned because two WalMarts shut down in my senatorial district, one in Raymondsville. 167 jobs were lost. To me, that's painful. Uh, in Brownsville, 100 some odd jobs right. were lost. Also, very painful because those those families. Uh, obviously, uh, depend on that that money, uh, their salaries, their their jobs to be able to pay their rents or home mortgages, their home, their cars, give a little money to their children. So, anytime we lose jobs, it's it's um, it's heartbreaking for me uh, because I represent an area of the state of Texas that uh, very high in poverty, as you well know. Right. So, but we've been blessed. Um, you know, the the things that have transpired and what is 
what you know, a lot of things have been transformed here. In higher education uh, has is now something very special for the children of our state. Um, our infrastructure has been um, has improved over the years because of the of the funds that have been um, you know uh, sent our way. Um, we have worked together as a delegation. Uh, we've invested tons of money in this area of the state. So we're doing pretty good in that respect. Uh, I just want to make sure that we not only sustain the jobs we have, um, but increase. Keep, 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 keep a good thing sure. going. Well, well, let me, to that point, let me come at this question of the price sure. of oil and the budget from a different side. You all approved about $4 billion in tax cuts uh, this last session. You reduced the franchise tax, business tax, by 25% and you voted to raise the homestead exemption to give taxpayers of this state a modest amount of money. It's not an enormous amount, but a modest amount. In retrospect, knowing what you know now about the price of oil, was it prudent to give away $4 billion in tax cuts, or should that money have been spent on public education, health care, and, and the like? So. You know, I think it would have happened anyway, uh, based on the, the, um, the environment we're working in. Today. Politically, it's popular different, to give tax cuts. When right? I got to the Senate, after serving in the House for four years, there was 23 Democrats, and I'm not trying to pit ourselves, uh, Democrats and Republicans, you know, aside. Obviously, we need to work together to make things happen, but, you know, that's changed. Um, I've always been a conservative Democrat uh, because of my family values, because of my upbringing, uh, but I also want to make sure that we have the funds that are necessary to uh, address the needs of the less fortunate, those that are ill, those that are hungry in our right. community, those that are uh, falling in hard times, lost their jobs, etc. But I, I think that, and I voted for a $10 billion tax uh, um, decrease, I guess, uh, or, or a benefit for the taxpayers with George W. Bush, another $10 billion with the, under Rick uh, Perry, Governor Perry. And, and this last one, as you mentioned, um, obviously we need funds to operate. I'm still hurting inside over what happened in 2011, and you know best. Right. You know the cuts were devastating. Uh, 5.4 billion dollars to, to public education, and that's and money 7.2 that is, in healthcare, and that's money that still has not come back all the way to the exactly. level, the pre-2011 levels. And so, Chairman Lazano, this is the. I think Senator Lucio makes exactly the. The right point. You know, you've got people in your district and his district who really do need support of the state, help from the state. There are a lot of social and physical infrastructure issues mm -hmm. that could use more attention. You gave four billion dollars back to the taxpayers and to businesses. Was that the right decision in retrospect, or should some of that money have come back into some of the programs he mentioned, public education, health care, and, and, and all that? You know, um, with with my business background, uh, one of the things I'll say is that. If oil was twenty-eight dollars a barrel um, in January, um, I would have really had a problem voting for tax cuts because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know if Saudi Arabia is actually going to work out a compromise on curtailing uh, their production. Um, so this glut in the market might continue further, and um, that uncertainty, I think. Um, we as legislators need to make sure that, that we remove that uncertainty as much as possible. And so I would much have rather obviously have seen that go into um, our education. I had, I had bills off yeah. to put more money in pre-K to fully restore the cuts. Had, had you known. Absolutely. Had, so, so you get a do-over because here we have interim charges from your boss, the speaker, mm -hmm. from your boss, chairman, the lieutenant governor, saying that we need to look at property tax cuts in the next session as well. You didn't know what the price of oil would be when you started. You do know now. So are you going to look at tax cuts again? You know, as a, again, as a, with a business background, you can't cut revenue that you don't have. And so if, if in the future we don't have excess revenue and we cut our way into being in a deficit, that's just... So not, then maybe you might not be able to afford that. I, I don't think I can, I can you know, I can stand on my own two feet and say, and I just said it a while ago, over what, 20, 21 billion dollar tax cuts that have taken place over the, my term of office. Um, I think we need to look at enrollment growth, make sure it's funded. Uh, we right. didn't do that in 2011. Uh, if we really want quality education, we have to pay uh, to get quality educators. 
uh, and a lot of people are leaving their, 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 their teaching positions in Dallas. I think you need 200 bilingual teachers in Houston, the same thing. I mean, we, we are at a, at a time where we need to evaluate and make a, a, rough, a tough decision on, on whether or not we're going to seek, uh, you know, the, the best of the best for our children. In, our, my, in my case, my grandchildren's teachers, I want them to be able to have the right environment. That means better schools. Um, our schools are, are, are going down and they're in need of repair. They, or replacement. Right. Uh, there's a lot of things out there in, in, in the field of education that we need to address. And, and cutting back is not going to help us achieve our goals. So your vice chairman of the Education Committee in the Senate, again, you've been around long enough that you've seen these fights come and go. You, were, you referenced the 2011 cuts to public education. As you both know, there's a school finance lawsuit right now sitting at the Supreme Court being appealed by the state. Some number, 600 or more school districts sued the state, as happens every couple of years, saying that the system of funding public education in Texas is not adequate, is not equitable, is out of compliance with the Constitution. Up to this point, the courts have found with the school districts. And at the last ruling level, the district judge in Austin, he said that if the state ends up losing this lawsuit, you all could be on the hook for as much as $2,000 per enrolled public school student, 2,000 times Five million students, that's 10 billion more a year, or 20 billion more a biennium in public education. That would be an enormous investment in education. Do you have that money? Do you need that money? And Senator, is it about money only to make schools better? We have some money in the rainy day fund, as you well know, $9.4 billion at this time. Growing, if we go past the $10 billion mark, you know we have to uh, spend it. I hope to have 14, 15 billion dollars in there so we can put back into education. And you would put that money back, back into education? Absolutely, right. absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I think we have a constitutional duty, a responsibility to the next generation of leaders to be able to invest in their future. And if we don't do that, it's, you know, shame on us because history's going to pinpoint those people who obviously didn't stem up stand up to the plate. Right. I don't want to uh, uh, paint everybody with the same brush, uh, Chairman Lozano, but it, it, it is an article of faith in some Republican circles mm -hmm. that it is wrong to think that money is the solution to every problem, and particularly to public education. Mm -hmm. You'll hear people say, well, there's no correlation between spending per student and performance. If you look at some of the states that spend even more per student than Texas does, their performance in the schools, their performance of their students is actually lower than ours. If money simply solved the problem, then you'd think the places that spent the most would do the best. The TEA, though, when they rank schools, says that it is roughly a difference of $1,000 per student spent. The best schools spend $1,000 more per student than the schools at the bottom. Where do you come down on this? Do you think money matters? Is there an, a, a relation between money and performance? It's definitely part of the solution. Um, it's a combination of things. You know, I always tell everyone everywhere I go that I was raised in Fremont, Texas, K through 12, and I had a good education. And the school district was getting more per student then than it is now. Um, so Fremont almost shut down as a result of uh, really over the, I don't know how many years it's been since the legislature has actually passed the school finance bill. It's been passed by courts. It's been enacted by courts. Well, it, it, honestly, what happens is they have to put a gun to your head yeah. to do, as an institution, what you probably know you should be doing anyway, yeah. right? And so I remember going to UIO meetings and seeing, I won't say which school districts, but kids pulled up in their school buses with tint, air conditioning. Um, our air conditioning was putting all the windows down. <laughs> and right. there was a difference just in that aspect. Um, our school districts, especially in rural, can't pay what larger cities pay. Um, and so there's a lot of issues that money does affect. And um, the issue of testing is huge. What, we should not be testing our children to death. Teachers should not be worried about losing their homes if their kids don't perform well on a test. It, it could be a matter of you had a bad day when you took a test. And tests are not ad uh, adequate indicators of a child's uh, intellectual capability or potential. And so. It's a combination of a lot of things that we also have to be, uh, so society has changed a lot as well. Um, we have uh, a lot of kids today that don't have parents. They're being raised by their grandparents. 
who are just barely making ends meet on Social Security, uh, and they're having to take Pepito to school as well, their grandson. These are problems that weren't as large back in the 80s or before. Um, and so, but money is a, a, a part of that solution. What's, what's the other part? If it's not just money, what's the other part? Um, changing the way we, we rate school districts. I just have a hard time um, rating a school district, rating a child based on how they did on the test. But shouldn't I, as a parent or as a taxpayer, have a way to know yes, whether schools or districts are doing a good job spending my tax dollars to educate kids? Yes, and, and when you're involved in your community, when you're involved in the school district as a parent, you can see if your teachers are trying. You can really see that. You can, you can, it, it's just being part of community engagement. And so that's actually one of the metrics today that's been part of the school rating system that wasn't there before. Right. But, you, but you're opposed to the idea of every school getting essentially a grade. And in fact, you all have moved away from what was the old system of ranking schools to now actually a letter grade system. That's now going to be implemented, A through F. Yes. So I'll be able to look up on the TEA's website or the Texas Tribune's website, Prima High School, and I'll be able to see how it, how it, what its grade is. Because every school district is different. Is that okay, though? You don't like that? Honestly, um, when you use the same metrics for every school district, when they're all different, that's not right. And, and when I started school, it was in 1979, a bill passed by, by the, the Democrat legislature that created what today, what became the team's test, which I took in 1985 and 86, and then it became the toss. And, but I never had the pressure the kids have today. I mean, they're in, right. they're in gymnasiums having pep rallies to be positive about taking the test. That's how much stress it is. Let, let, me, let me ask Chairman Lucio a, 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 a version of this. You know, you mentioned George W. Bush, when George W. Bush was governor. We had a, a began and are still having a big conversation about accountability. It was, I'm not gonna put words in the former governor's mouth, but the conversation was around this idea. Ranking or rating or understanding how good public schools are can't be like middle school field day. Everybody gets a ribbon, right? We've got to have a way to tell successful schools from unsuccessful schools because candidly, parents and community members have a right if a school's not working to shake their fist at the school district or at the legislature and say, we deserve better. Shouldn't we be telling people which schools are good and which schools well, are good? First of all, I enjoyed working with George W. Bush. We would play golf before he went to Washington. And he was a down-to-earth person. I, I really enjoyed my conversations with him. I had many as we worked the legislative sessions. Um, I, I, you know, what, what the representative said, uh, makes sense. In 1963, when I was playing, I was captain of the golf team in Brownsville, Texas. We show up in San Antonio, and all the schools uh, drove in in 63 Buicks and 63 Pontiacs, and we had a 1954 Ford that had a hole in the on the on the. So we would count all the white lines on the highway <laughs> going to San Antonio, and then you know, we get tired. Money does matter. Yeah. Money does matter, and you cannot parade our school system today with yesterday's prices. Technology is changing. Uh, the demand of, of, of the things that we use in our public schools to educate children is changing. The school buses, everything is, is getting more expensive. So we can't, we can't say that we can operate with the same level of funding we did last year because it's changing, right. and, and it's going to continue. I, I hope that uh, we can understand that in terms of rating, um, I, I supported an A through through F rating. Um, if, if my school's at a B or C, I'm going to try my harness to try to see what I can do to turn that around and make it a right. A school. Right. You know. But if we're just passing and, or failing, then we don't know where we're at. Right. Right. And, I, and I think you're right. I think everyone here deserves to know how their children or grandchildren are doing, um, and, and, and if my child is going, or my grandchild is going to a, a low performing school or a failing school, you know what, I want it to transfer. Well, to that, to that point, uh, Chairman, that, that's another topic of interest in the legislature and out, this concept of what happens if you have a kid in a failing school. We talk about school choice as if it's one thing, and we know that it's really a continuum. At one end is the opportunity, if you have a kid in a failing school, to take your kid out of that school and put your kid in a better performing school in the same district. That's actually the law right now. Then there's the possibility of sending your kid to a charter school, 
Now, we can have a debate about whether we should have an unlimited number of charters or simply more charters, but they provide more options. Then there's the question of whether kids should be able to leave the public school district and go to a parochial or a private school, either with state money or with the scholarship provided by a business group. That's also been discussed. Where do you come down on that? People talk about school choice as vouchers. Vouchers is a bad word. It's a dirty word. In fact, school choice means a lot of things, not all of them vouchers. You know school choice, like tax cuts, are going to come back in the next session. Your boss, the lieutenant governor, your presiding officer, I should say, they're your bosses. Your presiding officer, the lieutenant governor, is like a dog with a bone on school choice. He wants this to come back up. What are you going to do? What's right for your community on school choice? I'm going to turn to the people. What do the people I want? I want parental choice. I want my people to tell me, the parents to tell me what they want for their children. You know, that's important to me to hear from the people I represent and from the people of Texas as a whole. You know, we're state senators, not just district senators or representatives right. from an area. And we we have people in the business community like Charles Butt that's against vouchers and, uh, and school choice, call it what you want. But I, I call it, and I'd rather address it as parental choice. And between now and the end of the year, I'm going to be doing some heavy visiting, uh, and I'm going to be trying to talk to as many people as possible, first in my district, and then wherever I travel in Texas, to see if parents want to take a part. I feel they should, because I think the problem, the ills of education, is because parents aren't involved. They send their kids to school and let the teachers be the parent and the teacher. Right. And you know, you, you have to be involved. You have to go to open house. You have to talk to, to the teacher or the principal when your child is, is not performing well and get involved. I'm doing something that's never been done before, God willing, I, I'm gonna accomplish it. Next week, I'm gonna contact all the superintendents in my district and I'm gonna tell them to identify not the top two, top five, top ten percent, but to identify the at-risk kids. I want three boys, three girls, ninth graders, because a lot of kids want to get to the ninth grade or to high school to taste a little bit of high school, and then they drop out. So at the end of the, their ninth year, ninth grade uh, year, they drop out. Before that happens, I'm going to take them to meet the governor. I want to take them to meet the lieutenant governor. I want to take them on the Senate floor, on the House floor, sitting down. I'm going to have some guest speakers. I want to talk to them. I want some of my representatives to talk to them. My son in particular, who communicates very well with the young people, the English is the third, and, and others who can make a difference to those kids and maybe turn them around. I want to march them into UT Stadium and sit them down and say, all of this can be yours. If you're a if you just stay with you get it if you get educated if you stay right. instead of being you know being in an unemployment line or a welfare line or which is there's no nothing wrong with that if you fall in hard but you want to give these kids more opportunity exactly right. I want to, so senator right. you, you know the argument against school choice and the argument that some opponents of school choice in as many forms make is that by allowing kids in schools that are not working or districts that are not working to move you're ultimately leaving the people who can't move or don't move behind, and you're not helping public education. You're taking people, human and financial resources, out of the public schools, and then public education becomes a dumping ground for people who have no other options. What do you say about it? Well, you know, I, I, I have mixed emotions with our charter schools. I think they're taking the best students out of our public schools who would have performed the same way they're performing in charter schools. Yep. And they stayed in the, in the public schools. Right. And, you know, we just have to have a, a, a balance. If we don't uh, address our public school needs in Texas, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of parents don't have a choice. If they're low performing, they don't have a choice but to seek an institution of learning for their kids in the public, set, uh, you know, level, public education level, excuse me, that, that would obviously uh, allow their kids to be successful. So I don't blame them for that. I'd like to see a charter school for at-risk kids. Right. Everywhere. Every community. So that we can have, we can dig into and do something about the dropout rate in this state. Right. Representative Lozano, are you for some form of school choice and do you worry about the question of tax dollars leaving the public ed system without the same accountability they would have if they stayed in the system? 
I, I do worry about the potential impact of depopulating our public school system. Um, about uh, there essentially being a brain drain of our public school system. Because I've seen it firsthand. In Fremont, what happened with a variety of TEA rulings that we fought back, uh, Fremont got bad press. So the parents started taking their kids out, driving them to Palfurias ISD or, or other school districts. And what you have now is, in Palfurias, this last uh, graduation, I think five of the top 10 students were from Prima. Um, and, and Prima is still being raided the same way as Palfurias is being raided, uh, just like every other district. And so when a school district is labeled as a failing school district, we need to be fair about it. Where are they? They might not be in Alamo Heights. Um, and when I was in high school, we'd go to competitions and some of my classmates from Alamo Heights or Highland Park, they had in their eight day, eight period school day, an SAT prep class. They were gonna do good on the SAT. Uh, they had, uh, it was just night and day. Their teachers were being paid $55,000 a year. Right. Mine were being paid $22,500 a year. And so when we label and hold both to the same standards on whether or not you're gonna be a failing school district, that's not fair. Um, and so I have a question on what's failing. Um, the other issue is, uh, I do have a, in my district a very good charter school in Beeville, Texas called St. Mary's. They have a waiting list of maybe 50 kids. 80% um, of those kids or more are underprivileged, from underprivileged homes. And, and so that there is, uh, we should not punish school districts that are trying their best. And we should also uh, not put a dagger in them when they're down. And so one of the things I would do is, like for the parents that have kids in St. Mary's, they pay tuition, some uh, pay some tuition. Uh, but they're also paying property taxes uh, into the school district. Well, I don't want them to defund that school district, but I would be interested in seeing if the state could give them some kind of uh, tax break of, of some sort uh, to help pay for that tuition, not coming from school funding, but from the comptroller's office. Some, some, other, some other way to help give them a little relief. Uh, I want to move quickly. We have a certain amount of time, not an unlimited amount. I wish we did. I want to move to health care. Chairman Lucio, we live in a state that, have the, that has the most uninsured of people of any of the 50 states, both the raw number and the percentage of our population. This part of the state has a much higher percentage of, of its citizens without health insurance. Um, we know that healthcare costs have now risen to be close to or to have just passed education costs in the budget. The healthcare cost curve in the state is hockey stick. From what I can tell, you all did not do a thing about the uninsured problem or the healthcare cost curve in the last legislative session. Why? Chairman. Let me just start by saying that I took a historic trip last, last year, or actually before last legislative session. I was so fortunate to be able to have six days off. I got into my suburban and I drove the entire state. I visited 15 dioceses. I wanted to visit 15 Catholic bishops and those in those communities. And we wanted to talk about, well, I wanted to see what they had to say about immigration, healthcare, education, jobs, etc. cetera, um, in those communities. and in the state of Texas as a whole when it, when it came to our moral obligation about addressing these issues, especially health care. I think it's, it's an incredible moral issue for me. And, um, love thy neighbor, open the door and feed the, the hungry, clothe the naked, etc. I can go into that whole um, chapter in the Bible that tells us to be considerate of those less fortunate. It really hurts me to see any kind of legislation that hurts those that have come to our state and our country at no fault of their own. That's why I really like George W. Bush. And I actually supported him when he ran for, for governor be, before he became governor. Because I, I, I really felt that in him, I saw a man that was pro-life, I saw a man that had some, some values that I, I related to. Um, and it wasn't a Democrat or Republican issue for me. 
never has been, never will be. But, you know, there comes a time in our lives that we have to examine our conscience in terms of what we must do as a citizen and also as a legislator. In my case, in our case, as legislators. And to me, it hurts me when I see a piece of legislation that moves the very ill of those children with special needs to the back of the wait line because they're undocumented. That hurts. It hurts for me to be able to witness that my fellow Texan, my fellow Christian, in many respects, is doing something like that to hurt a human being. Um, regardless of the age, your babies, your, uh, the kids in school, uh, those unborn, and then the elderly. Well, as so you know, healthcare to me yeah. is an extremely important issue and it, it hurts um, um, to be able to go back and see all the Medicaid funding that was cut in 2011 and the fact that our leadership in this state for the last few years, as you will know, yeah. has not stepped up to the plate and asked the federal government to give us our money, the money that we have invested ourselves as taxpayers has gone to Washington that we could receive back $10 billion a year for 10 years, and all we have to do is match it with $1 billion. And I can show you in the budget where we can find $1 billion. So you feel like the state has not done what it should be doing to provide resources that would get us to a, a, a situation where we have more health care available, more access to people in the state? Absolutely. We, I went to the clinic to get my, my shots, and I'm one of 10 kids, and you know, growing up, obviously we had hard times. And we were very thankful we had one clinic in town yeah. at the time. And, and, you know, it always, it brightens my day to be able to go to those clinics to see it full because I know that a lot of the people that I represent and that need health care services are actually getting them. And that's important. No one, I think, in this room is <laughs> against, you know, any kind of action or defunding right. health care in this state. But of course, Representative Lozano, you know that the leaders of your party, who are the leaders of the state, had an opportunity now in two consecutive sessions to expand Medicaid, to embrace the Affordable Care Act, as a lot of Republican legislatures and governors have done, mm -hmm. and to get those dollars back. Yeah. And So wh wh why didn't we do it, or why shouldn't we have done it? Um, I'll tell you, I did personally meet with, back then it was Governor Perry, about uh, forming a delegation to go to Washington to negotiate a compromise, like Florida did, and other several other states. Right, and call it whatever you want. Don't call it Obamacare. Call That's it right. Perry Care. Call yeah. it Abbott Care. Right? That's right. Call it whatever you want. Because it's uh, from a fiscal standpoint. One, that's that's Texans' money already. <coughs> Two, you're putting in one dollar to get basically nine dollars back. Or pretty good deal. Yeah, I take and, that action. That's a pretty good deal. And then you combine that with where I was raised, like here in South Texas, and, and being the son of a family doctor who's 63, who had quadruple bypass over Christmas, and instead of being out six weeks, he came back in three weeks because there are no doctors here. Right. And he has seen, since I was a little boy, he used to do house calls, and I'd go with him. Always would see people for free. Um, and that's where I, I grew up seeing. I remember one day someone came by the house at about 6.30 p.m. I opened the door, and they're asking for my dad. <laughs> he had a goat with him. <laughs> and my dad, I hear my dad, no, 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 está bien, it's okay, thank you, don't worry. So, of course, being the only boy, I had a pet goat for two weeks. <laughs> but then, without me knowing, we had cabrito. Uh, <laughs> we, we sent the goat to a place upstairs, right? That's usually what they, what they, what they say. But so you, you actually come from an environment which you understand firsthand, yes. the, the, the way this uh, issue those, used to be. Those are issues be, that if you don't... Solve them now with funding. So you are, or you are, or are not for expanding Medicaid. I'm definitely for Texas working out a compromise to to get those dollars back to Texas. Right, absolutely. Um, of course, the decision about what to do on this is going to in part be decided by the presidential race. We have a primary on on uh, Tuesday. Uh, will you be voting for Donald Trump, no. Representative Lozano? I won't. Who's your candidate? Who are you going to vote for? And you know, honestly, uh, one. Uh, I've just always been a fan of, of Marco Rubio myself. 
Um, I've also got to know Ted Cruz very well. He is our U.S. Senator, and he's been there when I needed him for the district on federal issues that deal with uh, businesses along the port. So you're going to flip a coin? Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm going to watch the debate. I'm, I'm really still... Haven't decided. Yeah. If Donald Trump is the nominee of your party, which honestly, again, come back to I can't do math, but I can count. <laughs> right. If he's the nominee of your party, are you going to be able to support him? He's going to have to... Um... I'm not hearing a yes or a no. <laughs> <laughs> come on, Chairman. Yes or no. Simple question. Can you support uh, Donald Trump as your nominee? Well, I, I, I still have a lot to see from him. <laughs> Very diplomatic, Chairman. Uh, Chair, Chairman Lucio, you're a man of great faith. You have two of uh, 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 rapidly pro-choice candidates running for the presidency. Will you uh, 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 be like what newspaper? Oh, the Brian Eagle, the, the Brian College Station Eagle yesterday declined to endorse. They said we're going to, the editorial was we will not endorse either Democratic candidate because we don't like either one. They said their choice was no choice. Is that your choice? No choice. Let me just say and back up. If I was a Republican, I'd vote for Cruz, uh, you know, and for many reasons. And I just see, but but I want to, I want to. How come? Well, I can't let that just go. Whoa. <laughs> you know, but you you touched on it. Yeah. And and there's some things that he values, and life is one of them. Right. And I think he's proven it. Uh, there's other things I disagree with him on, of course. But going back to the to the question, who would I? We do, I don't have a problem. Or who will you vote for? I have a problem. You do. I have a major problem because my own party at the state level scorns the way I vote at times because I value life. And I am a traditional uh, family values type person. I was, I grew up, I used to, my dad and mom used to kneel us down, all 10 of us, with our rosaries for 40 nights during the Lent season. You know, and we took a, a whole bench, obviously, at church on Sunday morning. So might you, but, might but, you vote but for I'm, one of the guys? I'm, I'm leading, I'm yeah. leading to, yeah. and I'm disappointed with our, par, our national party, um, you know, mm -hmm. candidates who, who just insist on allowing the unborn to be aborted. Uh, it's just disheartening to know that since 1974, there's been 55 million abortions in this nation, you know, innocent children. I mean, only 1% or so was rape and incest. The rest of them were unwanted. If, if you don't want a child, give it up for abortion. And, and that's my, that is my message to Hillary right. Clinton, who I supported against Obama, by the way. And uh, my son with, with, with Obama, I went with Clinton at that time. Family friends from the early, from the early days in, in our right. in our political lives. She's still a family friend, right? Well, you know, I haven't talked to her. She didn't call me after I supported her. <laughs> so I, I like. I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to call because I'm calling an old man too. I like the old man because I think he speaks from his heart. You can't agree with everything he says, and everybody says, "Oh, it's a socialist." But you know, I think there's some things that he wants to do. And I wish we could take the best of everyone and have that kind of candidate for America, right. but we can't. So we're going to have to make some decisions, and, and you know, I'll make mine when I go to the battle. God, they, neither one would tell me. Did you see? I tried so hard. All right, let's, uh, let's bring you into the conversation. We've got some time left. We're going to uh, raise this microphone up. We don't need you to, to kneel down for it here. We're going to raise it up. If you have questions, come on up. We'll ask that you ask them into the microphone for the benefit of the live stream. And we'll take as many questions as we have time to take. Uh, the gentleman, I think, is making his way up here to the front. And you get to be first if you want. A lot of things we can be talking about. Wish we had tons more time with these two. So great to have them. Sir. Welcome, gentlemen. As a disabled veteran, me and my wife are both disabled, the federal government has really failed us veterans. As you can see, I have a service dog. The VA no longer pays for them. Would you be willing in the next legislature to try and put some Texas money towards helping out our Texas veterans provide service animals for the ones that need it? Let's ask a member of the Veterans Affairs Committee in the Senate. What, what, do you agree with the premise of the question that the federal government has not done enough for veterans? Absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I used to 
By the way, from this area of the state, I used to drive my dad to San Antonio for health care needs, medical attention. Um, my dad was a disabled American veteran, a veteran of foreign wars, and all of us took turns, but I, I took them mostly. I had a little bit more time than, than the others. Um, and and I, know, I know how important health care, we talked about health care uh, a while ago, and who, who more should we support and help than the men and women serve, that have served our country in, in, any, in any one of the armed forces, uh, in time of war, time of peace, doesn't matter. What matters is that we gotta show some heart. Uh, I'm having a, a veteran summit uh, in my district down in South Potter. I'm gonna invite all the veteran service officers and all the, the, the veterans post, uh, American Legion, et cetera, BFWs, and I'm gonna bring in the commissioner. Uh, we wanna talk about these issues, and, and I want you all to tell me what specifically you'd like to see me right. uh, do for you. I this want to echo your sentiments, and I want to show why we should do this. This is a bipartisan issue also, right? There are very few bipartisan issues. It's in not, this not a partisan issue. No. Nonpartisan no. issue. No. Not a partisan issue. Great. Good question. Other questions? Sir? Yes? Coming, coming back to the education issue, you've talked about failing <laughs> districts, and you've talked about failing the schools, but having all of us who have gone to school, isn't that really the wrong unit of analysis? I graduated from Lamar High School in Houston. We didn't rate schools in those days, but we were 10th in the nation in SAT, so let's call it a good school. And I had this chemistry teacher, and failed chemistry with him because he was clueless, first year out of graduate school. Yeah. It seems to me that if you talk about schools, good and bad, you're missing the fact that it's really teachers. Right. Make a difference in our lives, not the school. Right. Well, Senator Lucio and Representative Lozano both talked about the fact that paying teachers adequately is often one route to getting better or the best yeah. teachers. Do, or, or, why, why are we not spending more time and, and energy on recruiting the best teachers and making certain that we pay them a professional wage, given the important role they play in our communities? I think that it's increasing uh, more so than, than before. Every day when we have retired teacher day, the gallery in the Capitol's filled with red t-shirts, all the retired teachers. They, they, push their legislators to do things that at one point they thought was not politically uh, correct or expedient for their specific party. But today, they're showing the public, the legislators, that it's not a partisan issue, that in fact, if you cut education, it's political suicide. And that's, that's a good thing that's happening. Right. Um, and I, I agree with him completely. You know, um, tagging a school is, as failing right. does not talk about the administration of that school. Fremont ISD for the longest time was borrowing money for payroll. And so that was an administrative problem. Of course, it's also a, a reduced tax base, a reduced state funding, sure. But, but there's also the administration of it. That's not the teacher's fault. Right. And here in Kingsville, and in Kingsville, we have one of the best education departments I've, I've ever seen. And I've been on a lot of committee hearings, hearing deans, we have Dr. Reese, Dr. Talent, if it weren't for them and Dr. Gonzalez, I think Premont would have closed. They came to Premont's rescue and saved it. They're, they, they, they've got a, a $1.5 million grant a couple of years ago. They just got a, over $5 million grant for counseling because you've got to get in the minds of the children to know right. where are they in life. Right. Yeah. Uh, Senator Lucia, you know, we think that teachers are like veterans, a nonpartisan issue, but in fact, you often hear in political fights, well, the teachers unions want to protect bad teachers and they want to get teachers to be paid so we don't have the money, we shouldn't be. This is not an issue without controversy. Not at all. Yeah. You know, um, and I want to add that getting the leadership behind an effort like this is so important. Remember, they, they, they control, the government control, he can veto a bill, he can lighten it veto a bill, you know, and with just the members of the of the Finance Committee, the Appropriations Committee, uh, the Lieutenant Governor and the Speaker both appoint members to those two important committees. Right. And if they're not behind this effort, it's not going to happen. And so you want someone to, you know, open their hearts and make sure that uh, 
they step forward and, and say, we're going to support you, so go ahead, do it. So it starts at the top. It starts at the top. Right. And, and, but, but it also, the way it starts is by the general public contacting them, communicating with them, and now through texts and, and, and emails and Social everything media, else, right? everything we have a, a, a better way of communicating with, with our leaders right. you know, from, from the you know, general public. Uh, perspective. So, you know, I think if you want to see this happen, you have to be involved. It's like anything else. Make, your, not, make your voice not going to happen. Well, in fact, Representative Lanao talked about standardized tests. How did you all get to a place where you cut tests? You heard from the state. That's right. You all took your directions from the state. Sir. Thank you. My name is Jose Antonio Lomas, Jr. I'm an honorable discharge veteran of the United States Marine Corps, second generation. I'm a confirmed victim of police brutality. I'm a confirmed victim of civil rights violations. I'm a former prisoner, five years here in the state of Texas due to my civil rights violations being violated. I, uh, back in 1991, here in the state of Texas, it was a felony for a peace officer to intentionally subject a person in custody to bodily injury. That law changed in 1993 to a misdemeanor, to which it still is to this very day. I would like to see this law changed back to a felony because we need to have respect for all people. And I'm still fighting for justice yes, sir. in this matter. Is that your question? You would like to know how we uh, I want this law changed back to a felony. It's a misdemeanor. Back when it happened to me in 1991, it was right. a felony. So this is about uh, you were in custody and uh, the- I was brutalized by peace officers okay. at the hospital. You know, this is, this is an issue, Representative uh, Senator, uh, the, the relationship between police and their communities. You know, we hear a lot about Black Lives Matter. We hear a lot about Blue Lives Matter, right? There's an increasing amount of tension these days between peace officers and the communities they serve. What do we do about that? Well, first of all, you know, I was born in a law enforcement home. My dad was a deputy sheriff for 30 years, chief office deputy in Cameron County. I respect law enforcement, law enforcement officers. Um, obviously, what you see on TV actually happened because it was video. It was, it was it, you know, somebody videoed it with, a, with their cell phone or uh, they were caught in a camera. So we, we see some abuse. We need, like anything else, if you have a bad teacher, you get rid of it. If you have a bad police officer, a rogue police officer, you get rid of that police officer because that's certainly not helping the cause any. Uh, and you know, everyone is, is, is innocent until proven guilty in our country, unlike Mexico where you're guilty until proven innocent. So, you know, I, I think we have a long ways to go still. The criminal justice uh, committee will be taken up and considering many bills. We can, you know, take your ideas, your recommendations. Uh, we, can, we can give them to those um, taking part in interim studies and maybe they can add them to their, you know, their recommendations for next time around. So we're here to echo your sentiments, to sign off for you on issues uh, on criminal justice. So you'd be, you'd be willing to consider some kind of legislative change. Ma'am, <laughs> Professor. Hi, um, so uh, my name is Teresa Gards. I'm a lecturer here at a and Kingsville in political science. And uh, we've talked about diversifying our economy, which is going to require a change in education because with diversification comes a change in jobs that require higher education. We need not just a high school diploma, but we need a college or an associate. Right. The thing that I have a question is, is that when deregulation, deregulation have, of tuition happened in 2003, which uh, happened right after I started college, tuition has constantly gone up because prices go up. We've talked about that too. The costs are not the same every year. The thing is now, with the need of higher education, whether it be two year or four year, our students are coming in, and in this area in particular, who do not have the money behind them to pay for education right. and are coming out with student loans. They're going out and they're taking out more loans just to obtain the education that they are told that they need to be successful. Right. And then graduating with such a heavy burden that they're paying too much or great risking default or losing their homes because of it. Texas grants available. I know it is and my students do benefit and I'm very thankful that it's not gone, it's still there. But unfortunately it has not risen at the same rate mm -hmm. as our tuition. What can we do, what can you all do as a state, as the state legislature to maybe help this? Because we want this education. I right. want my students here and I don't want to lose them because unfortunately they do great, but they still cannot afford to come to Representative, th this is an excellent point. You know, student loan indebtedness now has passed credit card indebtedness yeah. as the number one indebtedness problem in this country. It is absolutely the case. There are people who want to see tuition re-regulated in Texas that we've gotten out of hand. Should we be re-regulating tuition? You know, uh, 
one of the things about this issue is that it's, it's such a complex issue. I've been researching it a lot uh, recently, and there's a lot of interim studies that are studying it, because I just learned that uh, nine out of the 38 uh, universities in Texas, since deregulation happened in 03, um, only nine out of 38 have increased tuition faster post dereg than, than before dereg. Before de and so it's actually, uh, of course, when we hear that certain universities want to raise tuition, in Kingsville, it's not one of those that has raised it higher. The, the, those nine, I think the only one in South Texas was U UTB. Um, and, but even then, it was below the state average when you account for inflation. And but you, you don't dispute the fact that it's harder for families oh, these days yeah. to, to, to afford this. Uh, but uh, uh, Chairman Lucio, you know, the, the kind of tag team problem here is that completion rates in higher ed are pretty abysmal for a state that has such high aspirations for itself. Six years out from high school, we did a study of everybody who entered Texas public schools in the eighth grade uh, in the mid-2000s, and if you go six years out of high school, only about one in five kids in the state are completing school in six years or less. If you're Latino or African American, it's closer to one in 10. If you're poor, regardless of race, it's one in 11. The longer you stay in school, the more debt you take on. So in some ways, getting a hold of completion rates might be a solution. But either way, the, the affordability question in higher ed is one that seems really hard to, to solve. What do we call well, it? Now that the conviction rates have to improve, obviously. Uh, if they don't, uh, you start your education, you make a loan. You know, a lot of people go into debt and can't pay it off. If they complete it, obviously they can address it. They can become, um, you know, homeowners. They can, they can hopefully find a good job. And, and you know, life will be better, obviously. So we need to address this issue. Uh, and we have added to the Texas grants, thank God, after cutting it back in 2011. But I, I think we need to continue to, un we need to understand that there's pockets of, of people, of, of population in our state who are impoverished and need a little bit more help than others. And we need to do everything we can to help them because if we don't, uh, poverty can lead to by the, you know, ending up in the criminal justice system. It can lead, obviously, to uh, being a part of a role in our welfare system and all the things that we don't want to see with our children. What, what about, as you referred to him before, the old man, uh, Bernie Sanders' idea of free college? Well, should we, should we be, as a society, providing free, at least, community college for our Kids can find the funding. I, 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 who wouldn't want to see K through 16? I mean, a lot of people would, but it's the idea of finding a funding mechanism to be able to make that happen. I offered a one penny, listen to this, one penny per ounce of soda pop that's sold in Texas, and you wouldn't believe how much money we could raise. Over $1.5 billion, that's how much of soda pop, and I still and you'd want that. to put that into public education or higher of education. Course, of yeah. course, in education, higher. Public. And so the soda pop lobby killed that bill. Well, <laughs> they're probably gonna. A lot of people are gonna probably drink less, maybe, and that's good for your health. <laughs> but you're, you're like the mayor Bloomberg of South Texas, actually. You want but, to take everybody's soda away. <laughs> but you know, there's got to be a way. Uh, if you're gonna cut taxes, if you're gonna give tax breaks. There's got to be another funding stream, a uh, revenue stream to look at, and that's one that I think can work, and there's many others. We have time for one more question, and I told this gentleman right here at the beginning of our day together that I would be sure to call on him for his question. So, sir. Uh, Senator Lucio, <clears throat> I'm Lyle Brown, a retired professor at Baylor University. Uh, a few days ago, Governor Abbott appointed Julian Alvarez uh, to fill the labor slot on the Texas Workforce Commission. Did, uh, as a matter of senatorial courtesy, did uh, the governor talk with you about this matter before making the appointment? And if so, if uh, labor union members in your area interpret this as a deliberate Republican poke in the eye for organized labor, uh, how do you view it? Let, let's just be clear for the audience. Mr. Alvarez is the CEO of the Chamber, Ch Ch Chamber of Commerce, right? Former CEO. Former CEO of partner, partnership 
And I, I think it's an excellent question, and I, I think we need to address it, obviously, publicly here today. And I, I thank him for the, for the question. Uh, first of all, um, there's a tradition in the Texas Senate, uh, unlike no other in the country, where if someone in my district is going to be appointed by the governor, uh, the governor's staff, most of the time, his appointments manager, uh, will call me. I've talked to the governor as well. Every governor I've talked to, he called me, for example, when he wanted to appoint uh, Costco's to Secretary of State. Right, former Cameron and, County Judge. Exactly, yes. former Cameron County Judge. And, and, and this is the way I want to respond to that. If a senator in, in the district in which someone is appointed mm -hmm. is in favor of, of that appointment, he, has a, he or she has a great chance to serve. Obviously, if they get the majority on the floor. But if that senator says no, I don't want that person appointed, then even if the other 30 senators say yes, that person doesn't serve. That's a tradition in the Texas Senate that a lot of people don't know. Don't know. Right, right. Now, my position on that appointment in itself is this. I know Julian Alvarez pretty well. He has made transitions in his life. He was, for example, a DP, D, DPS trooper. He was part of the workforce at that time and belonged to his own organizations. He went to TSTC, Texas State Technical College, as an employee there. And then he went on to uh, be the uh, chief of staff for Senator K. Baby Hutchison, you know, serving on public issues uh, for her, <laughs> serving the public uh, on issues that came, you know, from the constituency in that area of the state that he was in charge of. And then he became CEO of the partnership, another transition, adjustment I called it. I think personally, and I talked to him personally, that he can make a transition in representing the needs of the employees of this state and representing them well. He's got a good heart, uh, he's an intelligent man. I told him that that is a nonpartisan issue that he was chosen based on his leadership skills and his background and his education, etc. So I want to work closely with him. I want fairness and balance. Of course I do. Um, I haven't heard from the labor uh, unions in my district uh, or organizations at all. I haven't had one phone call. But I have read that there's obviously uh, controversy at the state level. So if labor groups in your district are concerned that this seat is not going to adequately represent them as it has traditionally on the Workforce Commission. My, my, they should call your office. Yeah, my, they did not, but my answer to those that would have would be, I want to oh, confirm him because I know him, and that if I feel that he can function there and represent you, I think he will, and I hope he does, because I'd be extremely disappointed if, if, he, does, doesn't. if he doesn't. But, but I think it's going to work out. I hope it works out for the sake of making sure that labor has you know, representative of that commission. Got it. Um, I'm being told that our time is up. What a wonderful opportunity to spend with Representative Lozano and, and Senator Lucia. Please give them a big hand for being here. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, President Callen and the staff of the and Teamsville. We'll come back and do, do another event here if they'll have us back again pretty soon. Thanks so much for coming.